Okay. So I would like to begin by thanking Franjo Sokolic here to, for, for inviting me. I uh, already feel that I have somehow disappointed him by my chosen subject. He wanted to hear something very uh, hard about uh, thermodynamics. Well, in fact, I have chosen to go into entirely the opposite direction. And this is uh, to uh, uh, turn the tables in some sense. Uh, I got the sense that the conference was about uh, philosophy of physics, and this would be about physics of everything, including philosophy. Uh, so uh, uh, what I want to say is that my basic uh, idea is that thermodynamics is a, a far more general subject than physics. And that, in fact, uh, uh, it was discovered in physics uh, as a particular way in which systems achieve stability. But actually, I think, this is a thesis I put here in front of you, I think that uh, what happens in physical systems and what was discovered by people like uh, Maxwell and Gibbs and company actually happens everywhere all the time. So I am not, uh, uh, I, I warn you that what I will be talking about is not a, a, so to say, literary analogy or a, an artistic flight or something like that. I am, my thesis, which is of course open to discussion, is that this is actually happening, okay? Uh, so um, now I understand I have uh, roughly 90 minutes uh, this uh, divided by four gives roughly 20 minutes. And so uh, these, this is, uh, ah, here. Uh, this is, uh, these first two blocks are, say, 20 minutes each, I hope, or a little bit, maybe longer. Uh, then the third block would be a, this, what I call a discussion, but it's actually here on the slide, so it's a discussion of me with myself. And then, and then uh, uh, the fourth block of hopefully more than 20 minutes will be an open discussion, you know. Uh, I, that's how I imagine it. But of course, feel free to interrupt if you like. So <clears throat> the first part is, I warn you, it is standard boilerplate undergraduate thermodynamics, which I teach, OK? So uh, the not. Uh, the, the issue here is to put us all on one page. I'm not saying it's the only page on which we can be, but we need to be on the same page, OK? And this is my starting point. So I'm establishing a starting point here. Uh, second is a, a sort of a rewrite of these same things in a, a setting, in a wider setting, and this wider setting I call entropy as a language. I will, I will make it more clear what I mean by that, but let me just put, make a general statement here that essentially to use the language is a highest expression of cognitive ability. There are many languages around. Of course, we have natural languages, but we have also uh, uh, other languages like a language of politics or a language of, of uh, uh, community or a feeling of civic responsibility or irresponsibility, these are all languages. The language of clothes, for instance, I came dressed in a certain way. It's a language, okay? So uh, uh, the ability to talk in a language is not uh, related uh, to the ability, or it's only loosely related to the ability to express oneself well. This is not the same thing. If I go out there in the street, I need only a few words of the Croatian language not to drop dead of hunger or, or uh, you know, to find a toilet or something like that. Uh, and that something is already much more than nothing. That is the attitude, okay? So, okay, let's get started now. Physical fact. What I want to say is that stability is the only way to understand the existence of a thing. A thing exists if it lasts long enough to be noticed. I think that is a statement which is incontrovertible. And this means that... <laughs> that uh, <laughs> this, I said a thing, okay? Uh, this, means, this means that in order for a thing to exist, it has to find some way to stay unchanged for a while. If I look at this thing and I turn away, look at it again, it's still there. 
somehow it does that. Okay. Uh, well, if you can give me a case of a thing which, uh, what, what would be the exception? Could you give me an example of an exception? Well, something that only comes into existence very briefly. Two ah, but you said briefly. No, 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 you said briefly. Yeah, that's, said that's already here. Uh, uh, okay, now what I would like to say is that the big point here actually will be about time scales, okay? Uh, so turning off time does not mean turning it off forever. For instance, for me, an isotope which is lasts only for a fraction of a second exists for that fraction of a second, okay? So there is a time scale involved. And this is, in fact, one point here that there are always underlying time scales despite the fact that the thing apparently is static, okay? Sorry, yes? No, no, no. I mean, uh, what I mean uh, is uh, stays unchanged uh, superficially. In other words, I exist because you think I'm the same person I was five minutes ago. You can, you can, you can, I appear. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, if you think I'm somebody else, call me by some other name and f see if I answer. Okay. Uh, Okay, so the point here is that somehow the time is turned off. The, the system manages to stay the same even though the underlying laws of motion churn away, so to say, okay? And the mechanism by which it does this is well known. This is, a, 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 again, a fact. So I will just illustrate briefly this mechanism if yeah. I find some trouble. Okay, there is some here. Uh, so a critical part of this mechanism are the walls of the container by which I select a system. I, I separate it from the surroundings. What happens is this, that as long as a system is autonomous, in other words, it does not have walls, as long as a system is autonomous, there is a unique map from the initial condition to the condition at any time. So I have something like... V is a vector of, of uh, positions and momenta, if you like. There is an operator, evolution operator, and there is an initial condition, okay? So as long as the system is left to itself, I am actually dealing with, uh, in the standard representation, with 6n invariance of motion. This is the six, 3n initial positions and 3n initial momenta, okay? And uh, under standard mechanics, nothing can happen. Sorry, there is a hand up there. Please, uh, are you talking about this picture? I do not hear you. I am going to say, okay. Uh, so, uh, now, however, in order to find out the initial conditions from the final state of the system, essentially I have to set up a measurement, ideally. This can be drawn like this. I have some scattering and some particles come out of this. This is a scattering event, okay? But then here is another scattering event and there comes in here, and this gets re-scattered, and maybe here, you know, that sort of thing. So anyway, in order to find out the initial condition, I have to set up measuring devices here. And these measuring devices, when they give me V of t, then I can get V of t as an inverse of this operation. Sorry, V of 0 I can get as an inverse. Okay. Now, the problem with this thing is that mathematically speaking, it is an extremely ill-conditioned problem. Ill-conditioned means that ideally it is exact. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. However, practically, if I, if, now imagine N is something like 10 to the 23 number of molecules in this room. 
if I miss out a measurement on a single molecule, then I'm going to conclude that the initial conditions were completely different than they were. This is an unstable problem. Okay? So as long as the system is autonomous, this is something which is just my problem. Who told me to measure? The system knows where it is. What do I, I mean, what does it care whether I know? Okay? However, now come in the walls of the container. The fact that I have walls means that I have to treat the walls as a stochastic perturbation. Why? Because if not, then I include the walls in the system and the system just gets bigger. Okay? So this is an absolutely critical point. The action of separating the system and regarding it as separate from its surroundings introduces a physical thermalization mechanism, which is real. It actually happens. So uh, random photons, you know, which come from the end of the universe uh, just to spoil my fun, will thermalize the system in a very short time. And in fact, if you listen, you can find out what time by listening to the noise spectrum of a resistor, for instance. And then it turns out that this time is about 10 to the minus 13 seconds for a resistor. Okay. The thing, the system really incontrovertibly forgets its initial conditions after 10 to the minus 13 seconds. And that is the establishment of statistical physics. Because I cannot do anything with initial conditions, they become irrelevant in an extremely short time. The only thing I can do is play the game of probabilities. That is, that is uh, statistical physics. And so I have a scheme in which this is the microscopy, which I can never reach. And these layers here between the system and the observer are essentially correlation functions which carry memory of the initial conditions but which die off very quickly. And this statement simply means that the last, the two-body correlation function, which still remembers the initial conditions, dies off after 10 to the minus 13 seconds. After that, the system retains only first moments, averages of mechanical invariants, which are like energy. And this here statement, physics is stability added to language, is my paraphrase of a statement of Feynman who said once, mathematics is not just another language. It is logic added to language. So if you adhere to certain mathematical rules of, of, of thinking, of development, then we are spared some logical mistakes. That was his point. Now, what I am saying here is that in a very similar way, physics is stability added to language. And so if we think in a physical way, then we are spared some uh, ontological, you see, problems. <laughs> that, is, that is somehow the, the summary of the lecture. Uh, so now this is just uh, to go through quickly. I, I don't think anyone has serious problems with the statements as given. Uh, so anyway, if the trajectories are thermalized, I emphasize even the, the chaotic trajectories are not there anymore. All trajectories are chopped up like my, mincemeat, okay? So if the trajectories are thermalized, then all, I, all that remains is this game of, of probability. And then the most probable configuration is stable. We can discuss how to get the most probable configuration, but that also is done. There's the various ensembles of Gibbs. Anyway, but what is most probable at the macroscopic level will appear least predictable at the microscopic. This is an example of that. You flip a coin 14 times and get seven heads, okay? This is a very disordered sequence in the sense that knowing that there is half of them are heads still does not help you know which, whether the next one will be a head. So it's in some sense maximally disordered sequence. Well, this one, which is very improbable uh, mic macroscopically, is very predictable microscopically. So what we have is that shuffling these two guys is just a fluctuation at equilibrium, what we call a fluctuation at equilibrium. But also, you cannot tell from this whether I decided to call heads H and tails T or the other way around. 
Okay, I could have been capricious. And every time I flipped the head, I write a T. You cannot say. Okay, so all these fluctuations are symmetric. Anything that can go this way can also go that way. And in uh, statistical terms, it means that the distribution around the equilibrium is symmetric and its width is essentially governed by uh, what we call two body correlations, okay? That is a, a side remark, never mind about it. Now, at equilibrium, all thermodynamic forces are zero and there is no causation. There is only correlation. This is because of the statement I made before. You cannot say if one A is causing B or B is causing A, you can only say that they're appearing together. Okay, that's a simple statement. But now, now it starts getting interesting. What happens near equilibrium? A uh, standard view of a potential is that if you remove, go away from equilibrium, a force will appear which pushes you back. That's what the nature of the equilibrium, so to say, okay? And if you are close enough, the, the forces you excite will be linear in the perturbation. That is just the nature of a quadratic equilibrium, all very boilerplate standard business. Now, but now there appears something new and interesting, and this is that this system returns to equilibrium in a predetermined way. In other words, there appears something which is different from a correlation function, or what we call a response function. And response functions are just time asymmetric correlation functions. You see this animal here is a correlation function, and you stack at theta function which is zero, you know, for negative values of argument and one for positive values of argument, and you get a response function. These response functions essentially di this dictate the return of the system to the equilibrium, and this is what is typically measured in an experiment. You, you perturb a system by, say, a beam, and you measure the scattered beam. That is, that is measuring a response function. Okay, and the point here is that the system acquires an arrow of time as it returns to equilibrium. This is a, a, an irreversible process. This, this is the uh, uh, arrow of time by irreversibility. And uh, here you see the uh, standard expression for the free energy. But I'm also writing a microscopic version of this irreversibility here, which is known in the trade as Fermi's golden rule although it was first uncovered by Einstein in his analysis of the Planck distribution law. And what it says in modern language is this. If you have a matrix element governing a process, actually this is not a matrix element, but a square of a matrix element. So in notation, AMN is like MMN squared, okay? This is known also as a microscopic probability of an event. The actual transition rate or macroscopic probability of the event will be this microscopic probability times a density of states. This is what causes irreversible behavior. This is what actually causes atoms to radiate. The question is, why does the atom want to go into the lowest energy state? Did it learn that at school or what? And uh, the answer is very simple and fascinating, actually. <coughs> if I have a box like this, and there is an atom here in an excited state, then there is only one way that atom can be in an excited state, namely in that state, okay? However, if the atom is in its ground state and emits a photon, there are many ways a photon can be in a big box. So if I just count the ways, then there is immensely more probable that I will have a de-excited atom with a photon clattering about than the other way around. However, and this experiment has been done, if I decrease the size of the box until it becomes of practically atomic dimensions, this thing is called a quantum dot and it is produced, so to say, then what I will see is a practically undamped oscillation of the atom and the photon. Of course, you have to manufacture it in such a way that the box also confines the photon, okay? But in that case, the atom will just go clack, 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 100,000 times. It is one of the most, the best oscillators that you can realize experimentally. And it only means that this G is now suddenly equal to one, and the Mach 
the macroscopic probability is equal to the microscopic probability, and the microscopic probability of matrix element does not care which way you are going, okay? That's what happens. Yes? Uh, can you maybe explain once more how the space density is defined by the size of the box? Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> okay, uh, that is... Uh, uh -huh. That is it. I think that that's what you're saying here, right? By saying when, when you basically make a smaller box, um, uh, you, you basically are certain that within the next second the atom is changing space. Okay. Uh, uh, the 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 density of states. Uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah. You, well, you got me there, because uh, the standard answer is that the density of states of photons at frequency nu goes like nu squared in a box of uh, macroscopic dimensions. Okay, this is this can be derived from from simply the size, uh, the total number of states in a box in a in a in a uh, sphere the, which of radius p. So this total number is just uh, four pi p to the third over three. And then this animal is a derivative, but p is uh, like uh, h bar k, okay? So, so no, sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confu confusing two things. Uh, for photons, for photons, energy is c times p. So, so this thing is h nu, so p is like nu, okay? So the p square gives you a nu square, okay? But I, I have not answered your question because I'm talking about the thermodynamic limit, okay? And in a box which is very small, then G is just one because you can fit one photon inside. So it is, uh, I admit that I did not do the transition properly, okay? The point is that there is nothing about microscopic which requires irreversibility. Irreversibility always comes out because the system leaks into some uncontrolled degrees of freedom. And here I cannot resist giving you an example of the language of the second block of my talk. And this is, if you call u what should be and f u what is, then you can say that what should be is corrupted by this s thing, okay? This is the decay, the, the, the value of tears, so to say, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Anyway, so, sorry, yes? Yes? Okay, yes? Yes. That's what I said, yes. Yeah, so there's only one way to have a glass impact on my cell, and there are a million ways to have it smashed into little tiny pieces and scattered all over. But glasses don't spontaneously combust because of that. Well, uh, uh, sure, you have to hit it with a hammer, yeah. The, uh, no, 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 okay. Uh, now, we are talking about setup now. If you want to set up an experiment about shattering glass, then you have to shatter the glass, obviously. And then... No, 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 definitely not. Uh, what I am saying is that if you prepare the atom in an excited state, that will not last very long. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the answer is that the thermalization processes which are working here are uh, energetically comparable to the energetics of the atom. So if your glass were at very high temperature, it would spontaneously melt. That's if you like the analogy. That, that is, no, uh, ju just to, to uh, 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 underscore the point that uh, uh, we have... I mean, you are, you are pushing me into details, which may be fine, uh, 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 but uh, I'm emphasizing that this is a detail. The KT is the size of the energy measure of the perturbation of the thermostat, okay? What I'm saying here 
is that barring, of course, uh, symmetry uh, 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 constraints or something, which may result in a long-lived excited state simply because you cannot find a photon with the required properties. In other words, this G may be zero under some circumstances, okay? But again, speaking in terms of the generic case, this KT of a thermostat, which is an expression of this random search through phase space, will very soon find that it can de-excite the atom, but it will not, the, the released photon will not find the atom very soon again. That is the irreversibility, okay? Uh, okay, now the next step is what we call stationary states. And this is a very important, again, point. I'm, again, uh, I'm running behind my own time, so I'll, I'll... Point here is that we can sometimes delay the return to equilibrium by establishing a stationary state, and this has to be done always by the imposition of an external potential. Like, for instance, an electric current in a conductor can be ca held indefinitely if you have an, a battery of infinite capacity, for instance. That is what we call a closed circuit, okay? So the point here I'm trying to make is that these macroscopic currents are vanishingly improbable at equilibrium, okay? If you put a pot on fire, you will see a convection of heat, but if the pot is sitting there without fire, then there will be no convection of heat. It is a highly organized motion of molecules, which is totally improbable at equilibrium, okay? But it is easy to provoke it in one of these stationary states. And now the uh, important point here, which can be most easily visualized by, by thinking of a stationary state as a ball falling through a column of liquid at so-called limit velocity, which means at some point the friction slows it down to a constant velocity. It no longer accelerates, it just falls, okay? Like a parachutist or something. Uh, and this uh, limit velocity gives me a transport coefficient, which is called the mobility. And this mobility is actually governed by the diffusion coefficient at equilibrium, which is called alpha squared. Uh, uh, this is the term entering the diffusion equation. And the content of this expression, which was first derived by Einstein in his analysis of Brownian motion, the point of this expression is that actually the same processes are giving rise to friction as are giving rise to random fluctuations, namely these atomic collisions of, of the molecules with the ball. And this is called the Einstein relation or the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now, the fluctuation dissipation theorem has a very, very uh, surprising reverse. And this is actually, you see, if alpha square is kt times mu, then mu is alpha square over kt. That any, any uh, what shall we say, uh, fourth uh, what, uh, pupil from the fourth grade could say, right? You just divide. But it actually took people 50 years to go from this formula to that formula. So this formula was found in 1905, and this was found roughly in 1955. The reason is that meaning, meaning, it's trivial to, to, to shift numbers about. But the meaning of this is that actually you can calculate the transport coefficient from the equilibrium property. The transport coefficient is an equilibrium property. And this is called the Cuba formula. And uh, to show you that I'm not just uh, inventing things here, let me remind you, Einstein relation the fluctuation dissipation theorem came in 1905. Superconductivity was discovered in 1911. It was discovered as a transition in a transport coefficient. Famous figure for mercury resistance. This is resistance of mercury. This is temperature. This is roughly 4 Kelvin. So resistance is linear here and disappears suddenly. And uh, Lars Onsager, no, sorry, not, <laughs> uh, uh, not Onsager, the, the, uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, uh. Kamer Lingones, yes. Uh, Kamer Lingones, who, who, who discovered this, immediately said, ah, it's a phase transition. Everybody criticized this because they said, hey, you got a closed circuit, you got a current going through. It's not a stash, uh, an equilibrium state. What are you talking about? 
And it took some uh, more than 25 years, almost 30 years, until the so-called Meissner e experiment, which discovered superconductivity in a contactless experiment. In other words, everybody was convinced. Everybody was convinced that it was, after all, an equilibrium transition. However, look at this expression. Today, if somebody finds a transition in mu, everybody thinks it's an equilibrium transition because they understand the fluctuation dissipation theorem. I'm trying to say what is the difference between writing down a formula and understanding what the formula means. So even in 1930-something, they thought they needed an extra experiment. Uh, and nowadays, if you find a transition in the transport coefficient, everybody immediately jumps and says it's a phase transition. It's like a no-brainer. Anyway, finally, relevant for the rest of the story, are these so-called Onsager relations. Uh, essentially, Onsager relations say that you can have a transport coefficients which describe uh, exciting something by something else. And this is depicted here, where I have an electrical current which is excited by a voltage, and the transport coefficient here is a conductivity. And I have a heat current excited by a temperature difference, and the transport coefficient here is the conductivity of heat, heat conductivity. But you see, I also have these off-diagonal guys, meaning that the temperature difference will also give me a heat, uh, an electric current, and a voltage difference will also give me a heat current. And it seems that there are four things here, but actually there are only three. That is, that was, you should read the Nobel lecture of Onsaka how he was surprised in some experiments when he constantly, consistently discovered that he could parameterize four things by three things. Wow, 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 how did it come up? And finally, he realized that it was a reflection of the underlying microscopic irre irreversibility of the laws of motion, okay? So Onsager relations are a very good expression of the fact that we have simultaneously macroscopic irreversibility of statistical origin and microscopic reversibility. If there were any microscopic irreversibility, the Onsager relations wouldn't hold. So that's sort of experimental proof. Anyway, that part is almost done. This is a remark of Landau, which I read at the beginning of his textbook when I was a student, and it took me something 20, about 20 years to realize that he was actually saying something. You see, the walls of the container, as I described it here, are a critical part of the thermalization. They're a critical part of establishing statistical physics as a physical reality, not as some construction in the head, okay? However, the universe as a whole has no walls. Nobody is watching the universe in a box from the outside which means that the thermalization mechanism which we have established here do not function for the universe as a whole. And Landau says in his introduction, this is my remembered, but uh, so uh, if you go there, maybe the words are not exactly the same, but this is what I think he said exactly. Speculations about the thermal death of the universe are not scientific. There is simply p people who think the universe will die thermally have not understood thermalization. That's what he says. And now my rewrite of this statement is if the universe as a whole does have an error of time, which I don't deny, maybe it does, then the origin is not the one I was just talking about. It is something else in the initial conditions. Yes, please. Do you mean the confined things in space? Like I, I, I'm sorry, I have trouble understanding you. No, no, no. Uh, what I mean, what I mean is that, what I mean is that, as soon, uh, as soon as you have walls, you have to treat perturbations by the walls stochastically, which means that you cannot say that a particle coming in and reflecting from the wall is reflecting perfectly. It is reflecting perfectly plus a small error. I, I, I think the question was on a. Uh, uh huh. No, no, no. Actually, there is, this is the famous insensitivity of thermodynamic functions. For instance, 
the nitrogen in this room is wall for the, for the oxygen in this room. Also, when you, uh, when you do uh, chemical reactions in solutions, if the solvent does not react uh, with the solute, in other words, if it's inert chemically, then you can use ideal gas laws for the solute, as if the solvent were not there. The solvent is just playing the role of the wall. Sorry? No, no, no. Uh, uh, anywhere you look, you can imagine a wall to some extent, uh, or put a wall even physically sometimes, OK? So every little part of the universe can be thought of as a thing which is thermalizing. It has a temperature, OK? Interstellar radiation has a temperature. But the problem here is that the universe as a whole does not have a thermalization mechanism. It is an autonomous system. An autonomous system is determined by initial conditions. No, no, no. Every part of it can. That is the big deal here. Every but part of it can. No, 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 no. No. I can draw it, the picture for you. So this guy is thermalizing this guy, but there is nothing thermalizing on the outside. You can put as many of these as you like, OK? But as long as you cannot put one around everything, the thing as a whole is not thermalizing. Yes? Yes, Via from, yes, 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 yes. And so that's how you can understand thermalizing for any subsystem. But of course you can't understand thermalization for the whole system. Precisely. But if you want to understand yeah. something like thermalization for Precisely. the whole, you need it. Yes, for a thermalization, another way of putting it is to say to thermalize something, I have to put it in a thermostat. So who gives the thermostat for the universe as a whole? It does not exist. Yes. Well, I'm sorry for those arguments. Uh, I mean, of course, at some point you can, uh, but if you, le let me answer seriously, okay? Uh, if you exclude thermalization of the sort I'm talking about, thermalization which comes from random interaction with a wall, if you exclude that, then there is only one object, physical object, about which you are talking, and that is the universe as a whole. No, uh, okay, it is po if, you, if you write capital T and say that is the temperature, then already you have assumed what I'm talking about. It's not necessary to have it explicitly in the argument. But the point is, if you really exclude that, if you really say that, you term, uh, that your system is autonomous and determined by initial conditions, then the only known physical object you are talking about is the universe as a whole. That is the statement. So uh, let me underline just in another way. Uh, I, I'll, I'm not interrupting you, sorry. Uh, uh, what I want to say is that a statement which l sounds extremely general is actually about only one thing, OK? Because it excludes something which is actually extremely general, OK? Possibly, yes. I mean, I'm not a cosmologist. A cosmology is a very small part of physics, OK? So uh, the people who do cosmology, they are really interested in that kind of question. I, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm to everyone his own, what can I say? I do solid state, their temperature is everything. So, so it, is, it is a matter of choice, OK? So the, the question here is about making this choice conscious. But that does not refer to the physical system in question. No, no. Actually, look, 
uh, there is a, a counter argument. I mean, I could say, that would be maybe the easy way out. I could say, uh, look, uh, yeah, OK, maybe you have some good argument, but that argument does not apply to the physical system because the physical system actually thermalizes by external perturbations. That's fair as far as it goes. But actually, there is even a counter argument, and it is this. Uh, suppose I have a bottle here of something, OK? This is the bottle. And there is a gas in the bottle which is not around, some perfume, for instance, OK? And so I, uh, I uncork it. And suddenly you feel the smell, OK? Now, there is a theorem in mechanics which is called the Poincaré recurrence theorem, which some may have heard, heard about. And this says if you wait long enough, all the perfume molecules will come back in the bottle. Okay. Also, if uh, we had the example this morning, if an ice cube melts, if you wait long enough, it will uh, refreeze. So he tells us that, that long enough means much, much longer. Yes, and this is the usual way out of that counter argument. People say, ah, look, for 10 to the 23 particles, this will be 10 to the 50, 50 years, and the universe is only 10 to the little less years, so <laughs> you also forget it, okay? But that's not a correct counter argument. The correct counter argument is that it will never come back because it forgot where it came from after 10 to the minus 8 seconds. It forgets about the bottle practically immediately because of this physical thermalization mechanism I'm telling you about. And you can hear this. The noise in a resistor is precisely the signal of that. Uh, sorry, yes? No, 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 no. The Poincaré recurrence theorem is a theorem about the trajectory of the system in phase space. And it will say that if its system starts at this point in phase space, which corresponds to a particular configuration in real space such that the perfume is all in the bottle, then after a very long time in phase space, it will come back to this point, which means that all the molecules of the perfume will be back in the bottle. Yes, and this will never happen because the actual, no, 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 the, uh, the, what I'm saying is that this will never happen because the actual, the trajectory is shredded by the thermalization mechanism after 10 to the minus 8 seconds. No, no, I'm not worrying, I'm uh, answering a question. How is it not? But I am saying that the argument is irrelevant to anything that happens. That is what I am saying. Because the actual thing which physically happens is something else. Uh, OK, uh, le le let me go on. Uh, OK, now comes the rewrite, so to say, in language. Now this is just using language, OK? I want to show you that using this language actually gets us somewhere, hopefully. And I am at uh, 40, yes, that's very bad. I'm, I'm 40 minutes instead of 20. So anyway, uh, what I want to say is that the size of this space of random events has a huge effect in actual human interactions. That is my first statement about entropy as size of phase space. And this is an actual historical thing. In 1985, there existed two computers, a ZX Spectrum and an IBM PC under so-called disk operating system written by Bill Gates. And the operating system and the hardware for this were designed by Clive Sinclair. So this is a list of capabilities of these two operating systems. So the Spectrum had Windows. DOS did not. Spectrum had multitasking. DOS did not. Spectrum had user scheduling, which means that you could open a window and actually raise the, the priority of a task which you wanted to be done more quickly. That was under user control. 
It had a programmable shell, which was basic. Okay. You could buy a Fortran compiler for it, and I know a gentleman who wrote a very serious PhD thesis programming in Fortran on the ZX Spectrum. And finally, Sir Clive Sinclair got a knighthood, which Bill Gates did not. Now, uh, uh, quiz, which developer went bankrupt? We all know the answer. And the answer is the power of ignorance. What had actually happened was that uh, people bought the IBM PC because it had the little blue IBM logo, which they liked very much. And later, uh, uh, later uh, 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 Polls, actually, so this was a sociological investigation, later found that about 30% of those that were bought in 1995 were never unpacked. Okay? But the quantity was such that Sir Clive went down. Simply, he was kicked out of the market, so to say. Yeah. That is the S term. And the you will notice the, the numbers. You see, five people had bought an IBM PC and three people bought the Sinclair Spectrum, everything would be fine. Okay? But the point is that tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people bought the PC. This is the size of the face space I'm talking about. Okay? And that, that out, out did him, or did him in, if you like. Yeah? So you notice the minus here. The minus here is everything the energy part and the entropy part enter with opposite signs. And so uh, the minimum of free energy is a kind of compromise between the minimum of energy and the maximum of entropy. It has to be compromised because of this minus. Next, correlation versus causation. This is true event. This is actually, I found this in New York Times. This is a reference on the web. So. A CIA informant provided information vital to finding Osama bin Laden. The same informant was tortured. Question, did he provide the information before or after he was tortured? Answer, before. They actually tortured him after he provided the information. And why? Because they had to say that the torture was useful. So they produced this correlation. They had a checklist, you know. They had to have the same piece of paper with two checks on it. That's a correlation without bothering, you know, the time direction, okay? And this was a huge scandal only because the person who was heading the Senate Intelligence Committee was Diane Feinstein, and she was taking nothing from nobody. That's how we found out about it. And I must say that I cannot imagine another political system in which this thing would become public. This is possible really only in America. I, 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 uh, uh, th 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 this is really checks and balances working, if I can say. Yeah? Anyway, uh, the, my point here, which is uh, general, of course, is that in human society, bureaucracy is a normalizing force. Essentially, bureaucracy replaces all causations with correlations. It pushes things into equilibrium by design. Okay. And this is a very important insight into the uses of bureaucracy. I'm not saying it has no uses. What I am saying is that it cannot autonomously produce values. Okay. Uh, and this is the next sentence, actually. To avoid gaming the system, you need human judgment. That's what was provided by Diane Feinstein in that particular occasion. And uh, the American system was transparent enough for this to actually have an echo to, to, for us to know about it today, okay? But the point is there was human judgment. Somebody had to stand up and say, hey, hey, that, that's not it, you know? That's not how we imagine the question, okay? So, next example. IKEA versus Walmart. Very interesting comparison. This is from the obituary of the founder of IKEA. You can also find it here on the web. His, that is the founder. Wider skill was to make profitable deals that seemed fair to the customer. The ability to present business as a deal from which both sides gain made him one of the greatest capitalists of history. Now, my comment is that this is wrong. These two, these two red words in red are wrong. 
he actually made both sides profit. And I felt that myself when as a young father I was putting together my children's beds uh, bought at Ikea, I could feel that I was saving money by doing the screwing myself, you see. So it actually happened. By, by, by dividing, so to say, sharing the profit, okay, he produced a current. Look at that current. Go to the IKEA. Look at those streams of people coming in. This is a current coming from a potential difference. Now, the second example is Walmart. Completely different thing. Now, this I picked from the web. This is cut paste from the website. Savingscatcher.walmart.com. So there's, they explain their system. Scan the received barcode with your Walmart app. Fine. We check top competitors in your area for adver advertised deals on eligible, eligible items. If we find a lower price, you get the difference. Now, this is an example of dissipative relaxation. What is happening, of course, is that everybody else has to lower their prices to the Walmart price, and then it's finished. It's a relaxation into equilibrium without a potential. Okay? They're just equilibrating the system. Completely different thing, okay? So one of them is an original idea. The, the originality comes from the fact that they establish a potential which establishes a current, and as long as my turning the screwdriver is worth anything, the current will flow. You see, that's the power of an idea. Huh? The other, I say, is normalizing, essentially, because all they did is establish a mechanism for the system quickly to return to equilibrium. <laughs> rather than more slowly as the customers gradually discover where the lowest price is, okay? Now, eh, so we come to Cain and Abel. That's the title of the talk. Now, before I, before I do my riff, okay, on Cain and Abel, I just want to make sure that, uh, I want to convince you that I'm not inventing anything, okay, or re rewriting it, so to say. So I'm giving you two authoritative references. One is Genesis, Chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. That is here. The other is the authoritative interpretation of St. Augustine, City of God, cut paste from the internet. Okay? So, the story goes, the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Significant. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? This appears as a complete nonsense. Because after all, it was God himself who did this, you think. Okay? He was the one who made him unhappy by not accepting the offering, and now he is telling him that his being unhappy is testifying against him. That, that's a story. Okay? But in fact, if you read Augustine, you see that this is the point of the story. God did not respect his offering because it was not rightly distinguished in this, that he gave God to God something of his own but kept himself to himself. For all who do not follow God's will by their own will procure, will give gifts such to procure from him. In other words, Cain's offering was transactional in nature. That is the problem. And proof of that is precisely that he was angry when he did not get what he expected. It was transactional and outcome driven. That is, that is the, the reason why his being angry testified against himself. If you think when you give somebody a gift and that person does not appreciate it, you are only angry if you hope to get something in return. If if you, you just gave the gift because you wanted to give the gift, you shrug and go on. Your countenance does not fall. That is the story, okay? So the one thing I think Jews, Christians, and Muslims agree is that this God does not do transactions. That is not in his way, okay? So for him, it's either you are his or you're not his. End of story. Now, that's the end of story as, part as, the, as far as the tradition is concerned. Now, this is the thermodynamic riff I promised. Uh, the, 
I have to introduce a mnemonic device. This is something which uh, from time immemorial has been, the question is of course, how would the brothers know which gift was accepted? And the system is always the same. If the smoke goes straight up, then it's accepted. If the smoke clings to the ground, then it's not accepted. That's, that's standard. So what I'm trying to say is in my thermodynamic idea, smoke rising straight is a current while smoke the clinging to the ground are a random fluctuations at equilibrium. And significant conclusion is this, that Abel, Abel would shop it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so you see, uh, at point is that a transactional person who sees only the world in terms of transactions and these transactions are precisely the equilibrium fluctuations, the exchanges with the thermostat, so to say. Such a person cannot distinguish effects of ideas from random lucky breaks. He lives inside the fluctuation dissipation theorem, so to say. And he cannot get out. To him, everything is a transaction, and I have had experience with such people in meetings. It's a very interesting thing when you have a meeting which is genuinely open and where the people in the meeting are really deciding what to do. At some point, somebody, luckily maybe not too often, but sometimes it happens, gets terribly upset and starts putting all sorts of obstructions. What is happening? That person cannot believe that something is actually happening at that time. He thinks there is some deal in the background and that he is cut out of the deal. So he is making obstruction in order to get cut in on the deal. But there is no deal, so there is no way to convince him otherwise. It's an impossible situation. The more you try to convince him that there is no deal, the more suspicious he gets. And, and uh, uh, I've seen meetings blown apart by such people. Okay? That is a transactional person. That is a person that cannot imagine that a genuine potential difference can be established. Okay? So, and point is this, you see, to such a person, this current or whatever, the IKEA business, you see, you see that the Guardian commentator did not understand. He thinks that this guy was a master of illusion, that he got all those people to believe they were getting something. That's a transactional view of IKEA, it's completely wrong, okay? And so, you see, to Cain, it appears that Abel was winning the lottery all the time. Okay, he must have bribed the lottery officials. Cannot imagine something else. That he actually had a good idea which actually had effect. And so the first murder, I say, was the first normalization. Actually, he, he normalizes the world by killing his brother. That, that is the interpretation. And again, I repeat, to see beyond the fluctuation dissipation theorem requires human judgment. There is no possibility of establishing a, a state of values by rules. That is what I'm trying to say. We have some ability, which I will come to later in the discussion, to think outside the box, okay? But some people are not like that. Some people are transactional to the core. They, 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 they will always think that there is somebody, sh some shady deal in some other room, okay? Anyway, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was faced with a problem. This is that a feudal society, a society of classes, had to be replaced by a self-governing society. So it is a problem very similar to the thermodynamic one. He wants an autonomous system, essentially. Okay? One which is not driven by given layouts of class and, and, and birth and whatever. So he wants to establish an autonomous system. And what is his problem? His problem is, and he put it more succinctly in another letter which I unfortunately did not find. I, I remember reading it long ago. So I just put the, the short version, which I remember, the sentence. The short version goes like this. If you allow the president re-election, you will have a king and not a president. That was his worry. And in another part of the same letter, he says, 
we must make the office of president uninteresting to buy. A president which is allowed re-election is interesting to buy. And somebody, some foreign power, will come and buy him. That was Jefferson's worry. And now, to give you a physical interpretation, you see, these are the classes of medieval society, and they are encoded in the suits of cards, as we know them. Here I put the Italian cards, which are much nicer. Spades are spade. In Italian, these are swords. They, they, that's the most nobility. Hearts in Italian are coppe, or chalices. That is the priests. Then diamonds, denari, or money in Italian, are, are uh, uh, the merchants, of course. And clubs, or bastoni, are the uh, farmers or peasants, the lowest class in society. Now, the only two classes which matter are these two, the first and the third. Church has too long a time scale, the peasants too short. So what we have essentially here is an example of an adiabatic decomposition in which the nobility is averaging out the merchants. Simply the time scale of uh, uh, return on investment, if you like, is much shorter than the time scale of a hereditary ruling family, which is typically 100 years. Okay? If they say 50, divide all these numbers by two, it's the same. <coughs> Point is, uh, Jefferson's problem is that the re-election scale of four years is less than 10 years. So if the president is allowed re-election, uh, the merchants will average out the president. We go from the adiabatic limit to the anti-adiabatic limit. That's a physical problem. And in every well-designed system, the people lower must orbit, so to say, at a faster pace than the people upper. It's you known in bureaucracies. Senior bureaucrats last longer than younger bureaucrats. Here in Croatia, we have a system that every, every uh, uh, mayor of a village lasts roughly five, five prime ministers. You can imagine how orderly the system is. This is, uh, uh, so uh, the question, the physical question is not one of virtue, not one of morality, not one of intelligence. It is simply who averages over who, okay? And Jefferson's solution was brilliant. He said the president is not the nobility. The president should be expendable. If the president is there for a single term and goes back to his farm, because that was his idea, you know, that a gentleman farmer would go to Washington kicking and screaming because, you know, he must finally do something for everybody and then hardly wait for the time when he comes back. That was his idea. In fact, we have it at the physics department in Zagreb. I do not remember a chairman of the department in living memory who wanted to be chairman. <laughs> that is... Uh, uh, <laughs> that is a sign of a healthy system. Anyway, uh, so, so he griped and griped. This is 1789. 7 and 89 was the date when the Constitution was written. He did not get his way, and this led to a great falling out with the writers of the Constitution. He, he, he was, I think he had to be begged, actually, to write the preamble or something like that, because he was angry about this. OK, so discussion. This is, this is me with myself. <laughs> you just watching. Uh, uh, now, <laughs> anyway, what I am trying to say is that these two brothers epitomize two world views, which I call normal and original. Now, let me warn you that I do not use these words in the usual sense. To me, normality or originality are not psychological categories. They are not functions of intelligence, of education, of anything like that. These are, in my, my view, these are situational categories. In other words, when I go and buy a piece of bread, I'm in a normal situation. I do not worry what is happening to the price of flour in Chicago or something like that, or the price of grain, right? But if I am the baker, then I'm in an original situation and I have to worry about that, okay? So this is situational. And so this is a brief catechism of the two brothers. What matters? To Cain, only what is matters. This is the F part. And to Abel, what ought to be matters. This is the U part. Essentially, he tries to see the U through the F. That is a feat. It's not easy, okay? 
No, the next question, is the normal normative? To able no, let the normal be calculated by the statistical office. He does what is right in his eyes. And let me tell you, I think that a great majority of people are like that. We all like to think that original people are somehow exceptional. But actually, situationally, the greatest number of people are in the original situation. They actually have to work something out for themselves, and they have their head on the block if it doesn't work out. That's, that's the human condition, OK? Now, so, but to Cain, the normal is normative. And you can easily recognize such people. They all ask negative questions. Why have you not done that? My standard answer is, have I promised to do it? Who says I should have done it, you see? Because to a closed system, the reverse is also computable. <laughs> That's a logical statement, OK? If you have a closed set, then membership in the set and not membership are equivalent. You just flip it. But in an open system, it is not so. Membership in a set can be decidable and non-membership not decidable, for instance. Okay? A typical for a normal person is that they don't make the distinguish, distinction. The classic example is the Egyptian Book of the Dead. You know what they say there. I did not avoid paying taxes. I did not uh, sabotage the irrigation system. I did not. <laughs> what are you saying? What else did you not do? You see? That is, that is the normal. Yeah. So new things. The Cain thinks when he gets a new PC, that's the future. To Abel, it's the past. Everything visible is already past. Okay. The, the, the original person always has invested some, some capital, so to say, in invisible things, the things which will be, OK? So the view of power, that was the worry of Jefferson. To Cain, it's a lucrative position. To Abel, it's a curative. That, is, that was actually already said by Plato. Plato, in his Republic, says at one point, the biggest problem is that a good person will not be ruler. Because to a good person, ruling is a terrible burden of obligation and work. He doesn't want to do it. Q in chairman of physics department in Zagreb. Okay? I was once. <laughs> no one don't want to be ever again. Okay? But this is, of course, because we have something real to do. But to this guy, it's great. You know? He just needs not to worry, and it's gravy all the way. So collective events like sports games, one sees them as amusement, another as inspiration. And the key question, how do you control your world? One is by transactions, the other is by understanding what is going on. That's, again, two different things. So you see, if the world could be depicted as a single minimum, that actually it, the difference would not matter. Transaction or understanding, everything will end up in the same minimum, OK? So the difference only really matters because the world is complex. And you may find yourself here, but think it's better to be here. So the question is how to get there. How to get there without uh, climbing the hill for which you may not have the energy or the time. These events where you go from here to there are called tunneling events. And in physics, they happen in quantum mechanics by cooperative motion of a many body wave function. But here is an example from human history. This is a, a, a date, I forgot which, in 1967, when the Swedes decided to switch from driving on the left side to driving on the right side. And this is the actual a street in Stockholm and the moment of the transition. You see all the cars are moving on the other side, and there was not a single collision in the whole country. Which means it's easy to do a crazy thing if everybody else is doing it at the same time. And uh, uh, the, the uh, more common example of that, of course, is marriage. And uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to marry, you have to find another person who will do it at the same time. And this, this is then a tunneling event, uh, hopefully to a better place, OK? So, uh, this, I think, uh, this is again a matter of time scales. I'm, the underlying undercurrent of this talk, and I will finish now because I want at least 15 minutes for, talk, for, for the open discussion. The underlying current of this talk is time scales, which 
churn away beneath the hood, so to say, of the equilibrium. They're there all the time. The system has apparently excluded, turned off time, okay? But as soon as you poke it, it pops back as a response function first thing. But also sometimes it's highly correlated motion. That's fascinating on occasion. So here is a time scale of a person. Say that is a time of a productive life, a few tens of years. And here is a time scale of institutions, which in modern times it's long. It can be 100 years or even longer. In any case, at some point in history, we have a flip from the time scale personal time scale much longer than institutional. Institutional typically zero in Neolithic societies. There are no institutions to speak of. And some point we flip over. Now we have here these two fundamental worldviews, which I denote as Cain and Abel. But what happens when this happens, that people start taking institutions as givens, and then there appears a new branch, which I demarked, marked S as Socrates. This is, of course, the idea that you can somehow put values into rules. This is not exactly what Socrates said. I'm just using him as a sort of symbol. Uh, Socrates actually said something much more interesting. In his last uh, words, practically, when, when he was on trial, they asked him, where do you get all these crazy ideas? That was a question by the accuser. And he said, a little devil whispers in my ear. Okay. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that he definitely, definitely did uh, acknowledge and this in a, in a difficult moment. I mean, he was at death's door, so to say. Uh, he did acknowledge uh, the value of intuition. So to call him a full-blown rationalist is not fair, right? He, so I put him on the able branch. I could have put it here, but that would be wrong. So I put him here. But the problem with this is that then there appears a, a tendency to rationalize everything, to normalize everything. Okay, and this is an instability of this Socratic line which somehow ends up here. That is, I think, what we have seen over several cycles of history, okay? So I say Socrates started well, but then he got thermalized. Uh, and finally, this is my last slide before the conclusions, which we don't have to read, but uh, I want to come back to this, which I invoked at least twice human judgment. How do we do it? This is a serious question. Because evolution is an autonomous system, as far as we know. Okay? And furthermore, evolution is a discrete automaton. It is a robot. You have a finite genetic code of finite length, and this finite length of genetic code is expressed in a finite number of letters. There is a finite number of combinations, okay? No matter how you calculate it. It is a closed number, it is a, and evolution operates by changing those letters. So it is a robotic operation, if you like. On the other, and we know that robots cannot think non-algorithmically, but humans can. This is called Gödel's theorem. Uh, so, a qualitative question about evolution is how can a robot make a girdle? The robot is making something which is not a robot. Okay? Here I use the word robot in a strict technical sense of Turing machine. Evolution is Turing machine. Gödel proved that the Turing machine is limited. Okay? How does it happen? So this is a hypothesis here. And it is somehow triggered by this observation of Jung. He, he noticed that only adults and adolescents can, have, can become neurotic. Children and very old people do not become neurotic. And he expressed this by saying that they are not conscious. This is, I think, a profound observation. Essentially, it means that very young and very young, old cannot perceive context. they cannot worry about what should have been. <laughs> if we come back to our minds as little children, then 
you can remember a time when you simply did not understand, uh, you accepted how things came about, but the power of the adults was magical somehow. And if you know someone very old, you will notice the same thing. It is not a function of intelligence, but the very old except to be, expect everything to happen of itself in exactly the same way little children do. And they are not neurotic. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, this is actually, I knew the name of the lady involved. She was a postdoc about 10 years ago. If you, I, I'm very sorry I forgot the name. I, I, I found it this morning, to, uh, to, I refreshed my memory this morning, but now it slipped again. Anyway, the first lead author of this paper, this is called Human, if you Google just, Human Accelerated Region 1, H-A-R-1. Her name will pop up first. What did this postdoc do? Uh, she took the complete human genome and she wrote a program which was able efficiently to compare this genome with uh, the genome of a chimpanzee. And she was looking for regions, but in a completely blind and unprejudiced fashion. The machine was looking among millions of bases for regions where the human differed most from the chimpanzee. And specifically, she targeted evolutionary stable parts of the genome. Okay? And she came up with this. This is the winning ticket of the lottery. Okay? Here we have a sequence of exactly 118 bases. These bases are involved in neurological development. If there is a genetic error in any one of these bases, typically it is lethal for the fetus. The, the brain does not develop properly at all. Okay? It's a very stable, very sensitive part of the genome. Now, the difference in this part of the genome between a chicken and a chimpanzee is just two bases. And the difference between a chimpanzee and a human is 18 bases. In a part of the genome where every mutation is practically certainly lethal. Now that says something. Now what I think, and this is pure supposition coming from solid state physics or my experience in solid state physics, is that the rewiring of the brain somehow under the action of these new bases triggered a phase transition in the biological matter of the brain. Essentially that our thoughts are of a different quality than the thoughts of a child, even a child, let alone a chimpanzee or a lizard. Okay. Uh, the, the paradigm which I have and which I s emphasize is purely speculative is that uh, the, uh, it is the paradigm of the difference between atoms and sound waves, for example. So what I think is that our thoughts are collective modes of the biological matter of the brain collective in much the same way as sound waves are collective in, in, a, in a crystal, okay, involving many neurons, and that these are uh, somehow, that in other words, if you, if you just g look at the triggerings of the individual neurons, you will not see a thought, okay. This, I think, so far is not contradicted by measurements. Uh, uh, measurements indicate that you can say which bunch of neurons will fire when something happens, but you cannot follow a thought from which neuron is firing. I think that is intrinsic to the system. And the reason I believe in this story of mine, my speculation, is precisely this. Only adolescents and adults can have neurosis. I think that the genetic expression which enables contextual thinking actually develops after birth that the, the gen genes are still working, so to say, in a small child, uh, just as the color of the eyes, for instance, is not fixed until the first year. So I think that our ability to see context emerges around puberty. And that is what is, of course, perceived sometimes as a big shock when we become aware of ourselves in some sense. And uh, so I will end this, uh, just uh, the, 
we don't have to read that. I'll just end with a personal experience. I, I sometimes I go to schools, elementary schools and, and high schools, to talk about physics, and I have noticed something very interesting: that twelve-year-olds are full of questions, and they ask great questions. For instance, one little boy like this asked me. When you scientists all agree about something, how are you sure that you have not agreed about the wrong thing? OK, uh, that, that's, I told him, congratulations. There's two and a half thousand years of discussion on the subject, and it's still open. You know, he was very happy with that answer. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, but, but uh, 14 years old, it's finished. Nobody wants to ask a question. And the reason is that they are self-conscious. They're afraid to appear anything to their peers, OK? This is the group thing which is coming. And I think that genetically speaking, we are programmed for this group thing. And that, in fact, uh, a, an important part of education is precisely to, to, to stress the intellect, not the emotions or the self-esteem, God forbid, but the intellect, to stress the intellect to such an extent that this uh, 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 group thing does not take over, OK? Because once group thing takes over, it does not matter what the truth is. The truth is whatever the group agrees, OK? So it really matters, and I want to end on this note, it really matters that children are exposed to serious knowledge, to serious learning, to serious intellectual effort. Not because they will all become scientists, but because that will break the mold of groupthink. And so with that, I, 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 I finish today. Thank you. OK, uh, I'm <laughs> five minutes, but <laughs> I'm sorry about this. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Let let me. Here, yes. No, no, it is tied to any gas. I mean, if you. Look, look, me, that's what I want to disagree with. There's no force. What, what you have in a gas is the law of large numbers. You have a gravity to the moon. OK, uh, I understand. Th this is, I understand. This is terminological misunderstanding. When I say force, I also mean statistically induced forces. This to me is also a force. OK? So, for example, in a. In a near a second order phase transition. There will be long range correlations even though all the forces in the system are short range. So th this means essentially a statistically induced long range interaction. And in the same sense, I call a statistically induced force a force. For instance, if you look at an imperfect gas which has a long range attraction between particles, OK? then. Uh, the, the statistical force on the, on the wall is reduced by the fact that there is a physical pulling back by the other particles. You see, the, at, the, at the edge of the container, the, the forces are unbalanced. But these are real micro, microscopic forces. So I'm not only talking about them. I'm also talking about genuinely statistically induced forces, such as usually create pressure. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, 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 that I agree completely. Yes. Uh, actually, OK, I, I, can, I, can say, I can say there is a very significant way to order things in society which has a direct correlation with the physics. And this is what we call fixed frictionless constraints or feedbacks, okay? 
And in society, this is expressed most commonly in most societies as the rules of politeness. Okay? So uh, polite behavior has a significant component in reducing the noise, so to say. And uh, this enables the correlations which I would like to see, so to say, to, to, to happen. Essentially, here maybe not all people agreed with me, but nobody heckled. Okay? So th this enables me to put through an idea, okay? And uh, so, I, but let me say again, uh, however much one may strive to, to make these statements precise in a particular case, the important thing which I try to put across here is that I do not think that this is a literary parable. I think this is actually happening to the point of that the fluctuation dissipation theorem that people who think in terms of random lucky breaks will actually appear as resistance as soon as some movement is established. They start hopping up and down and screaming. I've seen them. Okay? So, so this actually happens. And I think that the reason it happens is that a complex system does not have many ways to stabilize. Essentially, the, the way it stabilizes is always by quote-unquote thermalization. And then we may look at what might be thermalization in the particular instance. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I, uh, just a moment till I get there. But could you repeat the question more loudly, please? The like? Human brain involves human Turing machines. Oh, no, no, no. That, that, is, that is solved. That is Gödel's theorem. Gödel's, we understand Gödel's theorem. And Gödel's theorem, no, no. Gödel's theorem precisely says that the Turing machine has a critical limitation. And I will tell you, I mean, it is not Gödel's theorem, but I will tell you the illustration of the limitation. What, what is happening? What, what, why, what is the fundamental limitation of a Turing machine? It is this, that the Turing machine cannot decide what is program and what is data. It is given what is program, what is data. There is this famous Uh, uh, well, uh, okay, the short answer is I have uh, never considered that question seriously, so I cannot give an honest answer or at least an authoritative answer. Okay? But I also think that uh, uh, to my practical physicist's way of thinking, it is a little bit uh, not so interesting, so to say. Because, uh, uh, le le let me say, uh, the reason is this. That essentially, a very technical way to say how we solve problems is that we turn sums into integrals. The sums are written on sets. These are, the, for instance, uh, sums over states. But inter and these are functions on sets. They are very easy to write, but very difficult to compute. So if somebody looks at that 
beast there, you may say, oh, maybe it's not Turing computable, or start discussing things along those lines. But actually, the way a physicist solves this problem is to turn a sum into an integral, and then an integral is a real function of a real number, which is the parameter of the problem. That is called solving the problem. Okay? So we do not solve the problem that way. Okay? The question does not come in a way. And I know that an integral is computable because that's what, how, it's, how it's set up. Okay? So the question is, can all sums be reduced to integrals? My quick answer in the middle of the night would be yes, but who knows? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that surprised me because evolution, I mean, in order for at least evolution in a broad sense to take place, you need, I mean, environmental pressures and. Uh, yes, 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 okay. As usual, the question is where you put the wall on, of the container, okay? What I meant by autonomous is that I do not need to know how these letters come about, okay? I, I do not need to know the chemistry of DNA to say that the evolution is, is a, 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 evolution is something which flips those letters. In this limited sense, it is an autonomous process, okay? I, I, but I agree with you, of course, if you include part of the environment, then your, envi then your system just got bigger. You actually said okay. mutation. Yes, 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 okay. Yeah, if you like, yeah. That's, that's actually, uh, from the modern point of view, that's, that, that, uh, that's the, your comment is a, is a development right now in evolution because they are discussing this, how uh, you can have, uh, 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 what do they call it? I forgot. Uh, anyway, uh, not all proteins in our bodies are actually coded by DNA. There is epigenetics, that's how they call it. There is some extra factor which is environmental, and, and uh, so so yes, I, I, uh, my my statement was limited. Okay. Yeah. So it follows from Travis's question. I mean, so do you not think that we can the human brain we may consider? No, I think that the physical level is uh, mostly relevant, except maybe if we could understand the phase transition. I'm talking about if there is such a thing. Okay. That then solid state physics would be a very serious, uh, so to say, way forward. But this is just my speculation. I think that uh, uh, for a person interested in what those bases do, uh, the quickest way is to change a base and see. And then they are not interested in the underlying chemistry except in so far as they must know how to change the base. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.